What we're going to be doing today is taking our first look at the Microsoft technology known as Blazor. Now Blaze has been around for quite a few years now, but it's been a little bit unstable, perhaps settling down to get the full features, but now it's at a level where we can treat it as quite a useful technology. But the thing about Blazor is it comes in two distinct flavours, and to call them flavours is to probably make them too similar. They're different dishes, they're different courses maybe even, because we have these two things called Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. And although they look rather similar, they work in very, very different ways. So on this first video, I'm not really going to look at too much detail, I'm just going to look at the difference between these two different forms of Blazor. And so what I'll do, I'll go to Visual Studio here, and we'll just go for a new project, and then I will type into the search simply Blazor, or the beginning of that, and we can see that we are getting as distinct project templates these two approaches, Blazor Server, Blazor WebAssembly. Let's start with Blazor Server, and I will start that up, and I'll call this Blazor Server Demo, so we know which one we're dealing with. Click Next, dot six, create that, and that creates our project for us. And then before I do anything with that, I'm going to switch to a second Visual Studio, and do the same sort of thing, except this one I'm going to go for Blazor WebAssembly. So we'll call this Web Assembly Demo. And again, just set all that up, and that gives us the two projects, which if you just compare what it's generated for us in the Solution Explorer, they do look similar, but there are certain differences. But let's run those up. And let's do this first with our Blazor Server Demo. So I'll run that up, and drag over the browser, and we can see that this is just the out-of-the-box application we get. We've got a menuing structure with just three sections, home and counter and fetch data. So obviously you could base your application on this, restructure it, but we've got pretty much nothing at all on the home page. The counter just has this very simple bit of functionality whereby we can click the button and the counter goes up. And then we've got fetch data, and that's just displaying some fake weather forecasting data that Microsoft have used in their template applications for this sort of thing for a long, long time. So that's what the Blazor Server demo looks like. And if we then run up the Blazor WebAssembly, one thing you'll notice there, just briefly, you saw that loading being displayed in the browser, which we didn't get with the Blazor server. And that's quite important for how it works. If you've ever used Angular or other libraries like that, you may notice you get a similar sort of loading because it takes a little longer for the web application to start up. But once it's started, apart from the name being different, it looks exactly the same. We've got our home page, we've got our counter page, and we've got our fetch data, which is again giving us this fake weather forecast as if there were some kind of web server with that data available live in some way or another. So those are our two applications. Let's now start taking a look at the actual structure of these. So let's start with our WebAssembly. And if we look at our WebAssembly, we can go to Pages, and in there you can see we've got a page representing each of the pages within the website itself. So there we've got our index, so that, apart from this little bit at the top, is really just pure HTML, although you'll notice we have some slightly different elements from HTML. If we look at our counter, you can see this is where it actually starts to get quite interesting, because what we've got is here we have our basic template for the page, because we can see we've got a couple of things that are marked out with the at symbol. And if you've done anything with things like MVC, you'll know that at is what's known as the razor symbol that allows us to jump out of HTML and into code. And in fact, the name Blazor comes from concatenating the two words browser and razor. Don't know where the L comes from, but that's the etymology of it. And it's because we have this mixture, but it's using razor as we'll see within the browser. So that at current count then refers to the current count that we've got there declared in this code section. And this is where Blazor becomes really completely unique because we can see that code is written in C sharp. That is not JavaScript, looks a bit like it maybe, it's not TypeScript, although all these languages are related, but that is actually C sharp. And so you can see we're displaying the current count, and then in this on click we increment the count, that calls that function there, increments the count, and it gets displayed. If we take a look now at the 
Blazor server example, we'll actually see very similar sorts of things. So there in our pages, we've got a few other bits and pieces that we won't really worry about at this stage, but we still got our index and we've got our counter and our fetch data. So if I go to index, that really looks exactly the same. There's no difference there at all. If we look at our counter, again, that looks exactly the same. We can see that we've got the code section with the current count and increment count, and then we use the at to insert something into the HTML. So looks exactly the same. Let's take a look, however, at the third of those pages, which, remember, was getting that weather forecast as if from a web server. And so if we take a look at that in the WebAssembly and go to Fetch Data, then you can see what happens here. We've got a table to display the data, that sort of thing. We've got more of this razor binding. But then down here in the code, where it actually gets the data, well, it gets the data in the way you'd normally expect. That is making a HTTP GET request back to the server looking for sample data slash weather.json and that will just be normal HTTP AJAX call essentially and we can then fill that data in. And that weather.json in this case is simply under our www route we can see there we've got that weather data. Though of course it could be a, a real web server that's just the, the simple way because that's not really what the focus of this template is all about. But the important thing is when we've got WebAssembly that is using AJAX making an HTTP request. If we look at the fetch data in our Blazor server, however, same sort of thing, the way it binds, everything's set up there. But now in the code, it's not making an AJAX request at all. There's no HTTP there. It's just calling this get forecast async on a class called forecast service. If we look in there, we can see that we've got this data namespace and in there it's got the weather forecast service and that's where it's generating that fake data and we can see that's in this data folder which doesn't appear at all when we look at the Blazor WebAssembly. You can see we've not got anything like that in there at all. And that's what tells us the real difference between Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly because in Blazor WebAssembly all the code that we're looking at, so all the code in this c -sharp block, is actually running in the browser. That is the remarkable thing about Blazor WebAssembly, because in more traditional web applications that use things like Angular or React or Vue or something like that, you would write your browser code in JavaScript or maybe in TypeScript, because JavaScript is the language that is understood by browsers. But now with Blazor WebAssembly, you can actually write C Sharp and have that C Sharp running within your browser. And that's why if we want to go and get data from the server, we have to make an HTTP request because it's somewhere else. Whereas when we are running Blazor Server, although the code looks exactly the same, all of this c -sharp code that you have here is still running on the server. So that's why, because this code is running on the server, it doesn't need to make an HTTP request to get data from the server because it's already there. And so the way that Blazor server works is actually it sets up a SignalR hub. So we're looking at SignalR a little while back, and that's why I looked at it, because it's the basis of Blazor server. And so each one of these bindings that we see here, or even in the really simple case where we've just got this current count, this code is running on the server. And when we bind to it on the browser, we're actually hidden away from us, but the system is setting up a signal R connection. So we've got a signal R hub running on the server and it can push data when data changes, or we can send data to it, just like we had with the rock, paper, scissors I showed you. But in that case, I was doing a lot of the programming for myself, whereas here it is just done automatically with some layers put on top of SignalR. But the key thing to remember, yes, this bit of the code, HTML obviously is effectively running in the browser, but this is running on the server. And every time we press that button, we do the increment count, we are doing a round trip 
from the browser to the server. The server does the calculation, just incrementing the count, and then sends the data back via SignalR. So in some ways, this Blazor server technology is rather like the very old-fashioned now ASP.NET web forms, where everything you did in terms of calculations was done on the server, and when you pressed a button on the browser, the page was submitted back to the server, the calculation done, and a new page regenerated. At least in this case, it's not the entire page we're having to send back, it's just a small amount of data, but it's still all happening on the server. Whereas when we've got Blazor WebAssembly, and again, let's go to the simple one, this code is running on the browser. Now that's the big technological leap. How do we get C-sharp code running within a browser? And it's all due to a relatively new browser technology known as WebAssembly. So that's why this is called Blazor WebAssembly. And what WebAssembly is, is the equivalent of assembly language for programming a browser. So assembly language, when it comes to operating systems, is almost the lowest level of programming you can have, just above machine code. It's fundamental to the really low level programming, though most programmers nowadays will use a higher level language. But what we have is the equivalent in a browser, and it's supported by all the modern browsers. And so you can actually write for WebAssembly in all sorts of different languages. So C and C++, you can get an appropriate compiler, compile them down to this WebAssembly language. Now, of course, C Sharp isn't compiled. So what actually happens is we need a .NET runtime environment, a CLI, a Common Language Infrastructure. We need to take that, have that compiled down to WebAssembly, but that means plain old .NET intermediate language can then run within that Common Language Infrastructure. And so it's actually the mono engine that's been around for a long time, mostly used on Linux and that sort of thing, but that's been compiled for WebAssembly. And so when we first access a Blazor WebAssembly page, we have to download that mono implementation for WebAssembly and then also some .NET DLLs, which will then run within that. So it's quite a heavy stack, but performance isn't such a huge issue because we've got such powerful hardware these days. So that's really the basis of how that is working, and that's why we can run everything within the browser on WebAssembly. And let me just demonstrate that, because what I will do is if I run up the WebAssembly demo again, and then what I'll do is I will bring up a second browser, the reason being that if I shut down the program in Visual Studio, it automatically shuts down the browser that it created, and I want the browser to stop. So I'm going to copy that, paste it in there. So now we've got that all working the same way. But then I'll go back to my Blazor WebAssembly and terminate the server process. So we've now not got anything running on the server, but if we go back here, we can see that it's still working. And so I can click on the counter, I can click on home, back on the counter. Fetch data won't work, because remember that does rely on the server, but all of that internal processing running entirely in the browser. On the other hand, if I try to do the same thing with Blazor Server, so let's run that up and then do the same thing in terms of getting a new window, paste that in, all working fine. But now if I go back and shut down the server and come back to the browser, well, you see immediately it's already failed because the WebSocket, the SignalR connection is broken. It's detected that. It's trying to reconnect. But you can see that the application on the browser cannot survive without the server. Whereas in Blazor WebAssembly, as long as it doesn't need to make a connection like it was doing for the HTTP request, it can carry on going as much as it wants. And that means that for things like progressive web applications or any situation where you don't have a particularly solid connection back to the server, mobile situation, something like that, at least with Blazor WebAssembly, it will keep going to the extent it can without connecting back to the server. So those are the big differences between Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor Server. If we just look at a few minor differences as well, we can see probably the biggest thing. Here we've got the Blazor Server demo. If we look at the program itself, where we're doing all our configuration, you can see it's doing quite a lot of configuration to set up lots of functionality on the server, including the fact that we've got this map Blazor Hub, 
So remember, we looked at the idea of how you have to map a hub with signal R. Well, that's the generated one for Blazor. Whereas if we switch to WebAssembly, we can actually see the program here is far, far simpler because the server is doing very little. All it does is when there's a request to the site, it serves up all of those files, so mono itself plus any DLLs you might have. But after that, it doesn't need to do anything. And so there's very much less code here because it's all going on in the browser. So what are the pros and cons of these two? Well, Blazor WebAssembly, in my opinion, could turn out to be one of the most powerful web technology we have. Now, I come, as you've seen from other videos, in terms of full stack development from the approach of having Angular to write my front end in TypeScript and then C Sharp to write my back end. And although that's quite a nice division of labor because it means I know which field I'm working in based on the language I'm working in, it does mean that there's quite often code duplication. There may be an algorithm I need to implement on the back end for security reasons that I do in C Sharp, and then on the front end for user friendliness that I have to do the same thing in TypeScript. And that's always going to be an issue because if those two algorithms get out of sync in any way, start behaving differently, then you're going to have a very confusing user experience. Whereas if I can use Blazor WebAssembly, I don't just take the same code. I actually take the same DLL and I can run it within the normal backend process or I can have it downloaded to the browser and then run within WebAssembly. So there's no discrepancy there. And as well as the fact that if you've got two different languages, TypeScript and C Sharp, you might have redundant code, you've also got a certain redundancy in skills in that your developers have to know both languages. It's not a huge overhead. It can have benefits, but it does mean that if you've got a C Sharp programmer, you want to move them on to web development, they've got to learn TypeScript. That, on the other hand, does have some slight advantages. Not a huge one, but as I said right at the beginning, at least if you've got TypeScript and C Sharp, when you're programming, you know where you're programming for. Whereas with Blazor WebAssembly, you might kind of get lost. You might forget where you are or start assuming you're in one environment and therefore write code that doesn't work in the other environment. On the other hand, when we look at Blazor server, I'm not a fan of it at all. Purely personal opinion, but it seems to have a number of issues that are going to mean it's not particularly practical. The main problem is that because we've got this signal R connection and everything is actually happening on the server, that means the server is no longer stateless. So with a normal web application, as much as possible, you try to make it that the server does not store any user-specific data. So that if you've got 10,000 browsers, you're not storing 10,000 bits of information, one for each user. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to scale because as you get more users, you've got to put more power, much more power on your server. But with Blazor Server, at the very minimum, it's got to remember the data related to the signal R connection on a per user basis. And on top of that, it's got to remember any data. So if we take a look at our server demo again, and just consider something like this counter, well, that current count is being stored on the server per user. So scalably, it's not going to work very well at all. Whereas WebAssembly, although obviously you might decide you need to have data stored on the server, that happens sometimes with any web application, you're in control, it's not happening just as the default. And then the other thing I don't hugely like about Blazor server is it seems a little bit invisible when you're making a round trip back to the server and then to the browser again. So whenever you change something, like we change this current count, that is a round trip. And I may be old fashioned, but I think you should be careful about that sort of thing because it is a performance issue. And even with great bandwidth and everything like that, you still want to decide whether you're gonna do something in the browser or send it to the server. And again, if we look at the WebAssembly version, I think it's nice here that on the fetch data, when we do decide we're going to actually go back to the server, we have to do something specific about it. We know that is an HTTP request. Whereas when we look at Blazor server, that just looks like any other call. And it's true, it is like any other call. The problem's not really with that one because that's still going to the server. The problem is with this one that you might forget is going back to the server. So. I'm a fan of Blazor WebAssembly, not such a fan of Blazor Server. And another issue that 
I'm in two minds about is the fact that although they are fundamentally different technologies, the code looks exactly the same. So we've said again, fetch data is different, but there the code for our Blazor server counter is identical to the code for our Blazor WebAssembly counter. It's doing something utterly different, but it is the same code. Now, there's an argument that that's a good thing because it means you can change your mind. Obviously, we saw things like the program and some other details are different, but your individual components are the same, so you could switch from one technology to the other. But again, to my mind, I'm thinking, well, I want to have some clear idea what's happened because I would write code differently if I'm writing code to run on the server compared to running on the browser because of round trips and that sort of thing. So it's a double-edged sword, but that's the way they've gone with it, and uh, we'll see how these things develop. But my money is on Blazor WebAssembly being successful, Blazor Server not quite so sure. So hope you enjoyed that. In future videos, we'll look at the actual detail of this, how you put these components together, what the features are, things like navigation, but mostly focusing on Blazor WebAssembly. But I hope that was useful. Hope it gave you a good insight into the basics of these technologies. If you liked it, do click like, do subscribe, and I'll see you next time.